Good Tuesday morning, Pastor Rob here. It's time for Coffee with Rob. We're in Mark chapter 2. Uh, we're going to start at verse 13 through 17 today, continuing our study. This is study number 7, by the way, in our book of Mark. Um, just taking a look at Jesus. Let's do a quick review, some travels of Jesus, where he's been. Actually, Matthew says at this point in Mark, he's living in Capernaum, and we know that's to be his headquarters. And by the way, that's Matthew 4, 12 through 13, where he says Jesus is living in Capernaum. This is where he's at here. Um, he's been from the Jordan River. He's been to the synagogue. He's been to Peter's home. He's been all over Galilee. He's healed a leper and then back to Capernaum again, where again, he finds his residence. So we're in uh, Mark chapter 2, verse 13. It says, once again, this is a habit for Jesus. He goes out beside the lake. He likes to go out by the Lake of Galilee or Sea of Galilee or Sea of Tiberias. All interchangeable, by the way. Um, he goes out there and likes to walk. Who doesn't like to walk on the edge of a lake? I mean, it's beautiful. It's serene. And, and actually, scientifically, it says it lowers your blood pressure being near the water. So, once again, Jesus went out beside the lake and a large crowd came to him. Now, there goes your blood pressure. A large crowd coming around. I think your blood pressure might go up. Hey, they came to him, and he began to teach them. Jesus is teaching. And as he walked along and teaching, walking by the lake, a crowd following him, all these things happen if you set the scene. As he walked along, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus. This would eventually be Matthew, Levi, Matthew. The same, they interchange. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Now, here he comes up to somebody who's very popular. How many of you really like tax collectors. Not many of us. And I like this portion of scripture for this reason. Jesus loved the undesirable. And so I say that because many times in the church and as a pastor, as a man, <clears throat> I meet people that say, I can't go to church. Jesus would never approve of me. If I went into church, uh, the church would burn down. Heaven would, fire would come out of heaven. I don't think people really believe that, but I do believe to a certain extent there's some self-consciousness there. And, and number one on that would be, I think it's because of the way people in the church treat people that may or may not look like them. Or when you do church growth, for example, I always tell people, we can grow your church. The Holy Spirit wants to grow your church. God wants to grow your church. But how are you going to react when people who walk through your front door as your church grows aren't? who you feel should be coming through your front door. They may not look like you. They may not dress like you. They may not talk like you. But that's what's going to happen when God starts moving. So remember that. When you want to grow your church, you got to be willing to accept anybody that comes through that door. And that's the example that Christ set. He did not care who you were, where you came from, what you did for a living. He only cared that you followed him. And so here's a prime example. One of the most oppressive, most dishonest, and undesirable people in the world at this time of Christ is a tax collector. And actually, look at today. We're 2,000 years away, and we're, they're still not popular today. You don't want a tax collector coming to your house and knocking on your door. So here we see this, and this is great hope to those that are want to believe in Christ because he doesn't care. He just cares that you come, and that's the way churches should be. We don't care who you are. We just care that you come and let us introduce you to our Savior. That's John 12, 21, by the way. You can look at that. So as he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting in a tax collector's booth. He says, follow me. And Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at his house. Here we go. Now he's at the most unpopular man in the area's house. This guy is not popular. Nobody likes this man. If you've seen The Chosen, the video, he had to hide on his way to work. So he didn't get beat up or mugged or murdered. And while Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him. Tax collectors and sinners. Actually, what you'll find if you look throughout the Gospels is that he was eating with tax collectors, prostitutes, sinners. The most undesirable people there are. And by the way, they're all sinners. And if you sin one time, you're just as filthy. We can dress up. We can wear nice clothes. We can have a nice haircut. We can have, uh, you know, just be popular socially. But if you're a sinner, you're a sinner. It doesn't matter what you do. And this is what Jesus is saying. I am not ashamed to be associated with anyone. So don't ever feel like you can't go to church. Don't ever feel like Jesus will reject you. He will never 
reject you if you come to Christ. He doesn't care. And so while many, Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him. And his disciples, uh, excuse me, and his disciples. So his disciples are following him. You have at least four that we know of right now following him. And the fifth has just been picked up. That's Levi. So you have Simon Peter, you have Andrew, you have James and John, and soon you're going to have Matthew. So you might have five, but there might be more. There might be other people that followed him that aren't the named 12 disciples. For there are many who were, followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were the Pharisees, saw him eating with sinners and tax collectors, here they come again. Here come your super religious. And this, this is what bothers me even today about the church. Don't be religious. Be a follower and imitator of Jesus Christ. What did he do? He didn't care who he associated with. He only cared that he could present the gospel and invite people to come. And that's what we should be doing as believers and as a church. When I was pastoring at Sugar Tree Ridge, I used to tell people, I don't care if you're working on the farm and come in barefoot. And by the way, one guy did come in barefoot. Right, Dave? And so he came in and sat down and says, I guess you said I could come barefoot. And I'm like, yes, you can. So come on in and enjoy yourself. We're just happy you're here. So the Pharisees see him eating with sinners and tax collectors. And they asked his disciples, they don't go to him, they go to his disciples. Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Now, Jesus hears this. On hearing this, Jesus says to them, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, to, but sinners. So this is, this is a, a misconception that that's face value. Basically what he's saying, listen, I'm not calling you because you're religious, you're legalistic, and you think you've got it all together, and you're delusional. You don't. What you're not recognizing is that your Savior is here today and you're not following him, and you need to. But these people, the sinners, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, they're not happy with life either. But they're not rejecting Jesus Christ. The Pharisees see him as a threat to their position. The uh, tax collectors and the prostitutes and the sinners see him as a cure to their disease. And so look at what Jesus is doing. I wrote these down. He hangs out with a sick woman. He touches her. He picks her up. He lifts her up. He heals her. And then he sits down and has a, do, a, a dinner with her because she makes it for him. And then he meets a demon-possessed man. And he casts, him out, casts the demon out. He meets a man with leprosy. And by risking total impurity, total rejection from the religious people, uh, from the religious leaders, risking total um, uh, inability to enter the temple because he's unclean, he still touches the man with leprosy. And then he sits down here with the tax collector. And as some of the other scriptures say, he sits down. Matthew 21, I think it's 28. I wrote it down here somewhere. Matthew 21, 28, he sits down with tax collectors and sinners. The lowest of the low. You ain't that. You are not that. You are a person. You are a human being. You are a human being with value. If you're on this earth, you have great potential. And Jesus sees great value in you. How much? He says, I'm willing to die for you. And he did. And he's calling you today. He will not reject you. You can never be too bad for Jesus Christ if you come in and ask for forgiveness, ask to receive him, ask to fellowship with him. You can do that. He will never turn you away. So he's eaten with tax collectors and sinners. And then, so I just wrote these verses down. The reason he says this is because these people know they have a need. These people know they're rejected. These people know they're unpopular. And so here comes Jesus, and he's giving them some attention. He's sitting down and eating with them. This is what the religious people are not doing. They're avoiding these people. And churches today should not avoid these people either. Don't be afraid to be associated with people that may not look or act like you. Or maybe you don't approve of their lifestyle. Listen, you don't have to give your stamp of approval on somebody's lifestyle. But I'm telling you, you're wrong for ignoring people. So you can go in and say, hey, look, you know, you don't have to say anything. You don't have to endorse a lifestyle. You don't have to put your stamp of approval on anything they're doing. But if you reject them and you don't associate with them because they're sinners, you're wrong. Because you're a sinner too. And so how are you going to present the gospel to somebody that you're not talking to? That you don't establish some type of a friendship with or some type of relationship? Maybe not a friend, but an association. Put some emotional change in somebody's pocket. In other words, you meet on a common ground. You may differ completely on ideals. I mean, politically today, we're so divided. You know, I watched the 
presidential Democratic convention last night. It was horrible. And at one point they're saying, let's be united. And then the next point they're just alienating half the U.S. population with their ideals. It's, it's horrible. But this is, this is a depraved mind. This is how it works. So we need to be united. We should need to sit down and have tough conversations. I call them big boy conversations with people. You don't have to agree. But can't you sit down and have a coffee with somebody that doesn't agree with you personally? Personal beliefs, political beliefs, religious beliefs. I love talking to people, by the way, that may or may not be, you know, Christians or even believe in Jesus Christ. I listen to what they have to say. But we can have these conversations, and that's what Jesus is doing. He's not saying, I'm going to give my endorsement on the way you collect taxes. I'm going to give my endorsement on the way you live your life as a prostitute. I'm going to give my endorsement. He's not saying any of that. He's saying, sit down and have big boy conversations. The only way you're going to reach people outside of Christ, the only way you're going to reach people that are sick-minded or in a sick lifestyle, and maybe they don't even know it. Maybe they don't even know it, but we can talk to them and say, hey, we want to lead you to Christ. Come to Christ. I got a friend right now debating on whether to come to Christ or not because she hasn't figured out exactly what Jesus is saying or who Jesus really is. And this is why the best way to begin is by saying, God, I believe in you. Come into my heart and live. Forgive me of my sins. And then just take Jesus' hand. And if you're not going to take it, he'll take yours and start the walk. And along the way, he will reveal to you who he is. Is. And that's what Jesus is doing here. He's not saying it's okay to te collect taxes. He's saying, render unto Caesar what is Caesar, unto God what is God's. It's render your money unto Caesar. It's his. Your body belongs to God. His image is on you. Caesar's image is on the coin. So give the coin to Caesar. It's his. But the image that I have is on you. And you belong to me. I need you. You need to give God what's God's. That's your body. That's your mind. That's your heart. That's your soul. But the coins, whatever, Jesus has paid it to Caesar. What is Caesar? Give him your taxes. That's what it is. Pay it. It's their image on it. So I, I'm just looking at that. And so I don't even know why I got off. But I apologize for that. But I'm just saying that I, the one thing I like here is that you can never be too dirty for Jesus Christ. If you come to him, he'll forgive you. He doesn't care what you're doing. So, But when he talks to religious people, the religious uh, righteous, the self-righteous, they're overconfident. Actually, and let me see if I can find this. Luke 18, 9. If you look at Luke 18, 9. You know, he really chastises the religious people over and over. And there's nothing wrong with being quote-unquote religious. You know, but more importantly that you're a follower and imitator of Jesus Christ. Uh, Luke 18, 9. Let me find this here. Says, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. And here it is. So this is the problem in the church and often and why people may or may not come in. Now, we're not responsible for their decision, but we can certainly make that decision easier by being welcoming in the church. And this thing here was pointed out to religious people. This is the Pharisees. And Luke 18, 9, very, very crucial portion of scripture for how our attitude should be. <clears throat> 9 says this, Luke 18, 9, to some who were confident of their own righteousness, this is religious people. I've got it all together. Look at me. I wear my suit on Sunday. I sit in the same pew on Sunday. I, I even give money. I even volunteer. I've got it all going on, and I'm better than you. That's what he's talking about. You're not better than anybody. You're doing your allegiance to God, which you should be doing. The some who were confident of their own righteousness he, and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went to the temple to pray, a Pharisee and the other a tax collector, a religious person and basically a heathen and hated person. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. But that's a deceit. That's a conceit. Basically, that's not true. We're all the same. We're all equally depraved and equally lost. And we all equally need the same Savior, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I'm not like other men. I'm not like a robber. I'm not like evildoers. I'm not an adulterer. Or even like this tax collector. That's horrible horrible. What he should have done is when I say, hey man, can I pray with you? Tax collector, before I pray for myself, is there something I can do for you? And sit down with that tax collector and pray with him. But that's not what he does. Jesus gives this parable. This is him speaking. Or even like this tax collector, I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all I got. This is it. So he's shouting out all his good deeds. Good deeds are not going to get you to heaven, by the way. You get to the heaven because the man on the middle cross said you could come. Verse 13, 
But the tax collector stood at a distance. He's humble. He's, uh, he, he's, he's, hum he has humility. He would not even look up to heaven. Uh, but he beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Same prayer we should pray. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than, than the Pharisee, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So, are you too bad for God? You may be delusional, being religious, thinking, I've got it all going on, I do everything right. Nope, you're a sinner saved by grace through faith. The blood of Jesus covers your sins. He does not care, and I, and I say that carefully, because your works are things we should do for the kingdom. But you're not saved by your works. Your works are an outward evidence of what God has done in your life and your commitment to him and your desire to lead other people to Jesus Christ is a work, but a work in, in rightness. In other words, we need to lead people to Christ. So uh, Mark chapter 2, 13 to 17, talks about the tax collector and Jesus eating with sinners and prostitutes and all that and then not putting emphasis on either one. It's just an example of how he is not ashamed to be associated with them. But he does chastise those who think they've got it all together. Those of us that know we're sick, I'm sick. I'm, I'm just a human being. I'm a man who needs Jesus Christ. I'm a sinner saved by grace. And if I get to heaven and I get to stay there, it's going to be because of Christ alone. But the good thing is, it doesn't matter how dirty you are, what you're doing, where you come from, how tall you are, how short you are, how powerful you are, doesn't matter. Jesus only cares that you come. And if you invite him into your life, he will sit down with you and he will fellowship with you and he will reveal to you who he is in your life. So everybody have a great day. That's Mark chapter two. That's lesson number seven. And I'll see you all tomorrow.